We have a lot of polling uh, actually to show some of the dichotomies that we have in the race. Let's go to the next block here, please. And let's start with the first element, the quote, dread election. Let's go ahead and put it up there on the screen. The share of quote, double haters has hit historic highs. Now, what you can see in front of you is that the share of Americans who have unfavorable views of both major party candidates is at an all-time high, nearly as high as 2016 when Hillary Clinton was on the ballot. There has really been no parallel for those two elections, 2016 and 2024. Even only just 13% back in 2020 said that they had an unfavorable an unfavorable view of both of the major party candidates. Now, this actually could be a decent thing for Trump. We'll get to that. We have to parse some of the nuance here. But last time around, the unfavorable views of hate both parties broke hard for Trump because people had a very negative view of Hillary Clinton. There is some evidence to say that some of that unfavorability could be transferring over to Joe Biden. But what this has also done is it has really forced a choice amongst key parts of coalition voters. Let's put this up there. As you alluded to, Joe Biden somehow has gained significantly amongst older voters. Now, traditionally, older voters are more conservative. And the thesis was that, yes, Democrats were going to lose older voters, but keep the margin relatively small and we'll blow it out amongst black, Hispanic, and younger voters. Well, what you can see actually in front of you is that a lot of the data that has been collected recently shows that there has been a big flip mostly in the last couple of years, where some 51% now of people who are over the age of 65 support Biden and a significant drop for Trump in his support, which was well above 50% in 2020, down to just 42%. And I think a lot of the data that we've talked about here on this show uh, can give us some inklings as to why. First and foremost is, is that the number one reason that younger voters, Hispanic voters, and others, people who are supporting Trump, is they want change. Even though they don't even like Trump, they just want a major change, a shock to the system. Inflation is killing them. They're having problems with housing in general. They see like a real shakiness, uncertainty in terms of America. America's uh, foreign policy abroad. If you're old, I mean, this has been the greatest uh, term, you know, in modern history, right? You've seen significant increase in your housing prices. You, in general, have a good stake in the system. You have enough of a cushion in order to be able to eat inflation. A lot of these boomer voters, I mean, they have very different views on Israel, on Ukraine, right? These are people who view Russia, literally remember the Cold War, and in some cases haven't really forgotten it. So for them, uh, they've gotten a lot of what they want. In fact, they probably hold against Biden that he withdrew from Afghanistan. These were the coalition of voters that delivered George W. Bush the same White House. They remember uh, 9-11. They're probably still steeped in a lot of that propaganda. They watch a lot of cable news. And that's why I said many of them may believe the propaganda. They, these are the key demos that keep all three of the cable news networks going. So for them, you could see that their stake in the system is actually doing well, while the stake for everybody else is not doing well. And that's what explains that overall drop. And when Trump runs against the system, he in a way is running against the consensus for a lot of the people who are older. Yeah, and just to underscore the fact that, I mean, in modern history, this would be unprecedented for um, Republicans to lose older voters. And it has been a huge benefit to them electorally that older voters have been so strongly in their camp. Why? Because they vote. <laughs> and yeah. we're going to get to this in a minute. The way that this is contributing to a huge shift in, you know, who infrequent voters favor. But just to pause on the older demographic shifting to Biden, it really is remarkable. It's interesting um, because, for one thing, I think Joe Biden is a product of his generation. What he has his finger on the pulse of is how your average 80 year old feels about these conflicts and about the country and about the economy, et cetera. And in fact, when you look at the issues, that Democrats are prioritizing, you know, the fact that they lead with preserving democracy. Well, it's older voters who say that that is a top priority. And so not only do you have the bifurcated economy that you're talking about, Sagar, where if you are an asset owner, which, you know, that very much skews along age demographic lines. So if you are an older voter, you're much more likely to be a homeowner. You're much more likely to have, you know, some investments in the stock market or 401k retirement account. You're much more likely to own assets. And those are the people who have benefited overwhelmingly 
from our economic system under Joe Biden, but honestly, for the last like, you know, several decades, that's yeah. the way our, our economy has been set up. It's just particularly notable and that divide is growing and growing. So for you, yeah, things seem really good economically. Well, that allows you to prioritize some of these more sort of high-minded theoretical issues like quote unquote, preserving democracy. You also have a, a group of voters and older voters who remember a time when there was a lot more reference and trust in American institutions. You know, if you're a young voter and your whole like life has been formed in the, you know, post-Iraq war, post-financial crisis, Donald Trump era, your whole like, oh, the institutions, the norms, the guardrails, like you just don't have that in you. Whereas for older voters, there's still this instinct that Joe Biden really reflects of these institutions really matter and we really have to preserve them. And that's top priority. Also, as I said, if you're doing economically better, you can sort of afford to have those types of concerns. So I think the democratic message in a lot of ways is perfectly pitched and tuned to this older demographic. And you are already mentioned as well on foreign affairs. This is the group that's the most pro-Ukraine. This is the group that shares the views of Joe Biden vis-a-vis -vis Israel and has, you know, in their mind, this is our ally and, you know, against the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And we just stand by Israel. That's what we do, period, end of story. And also have an understanding of Israel that's very different from what is actually going on in modern Israel today. So, you know, when you think about all those pieces, it makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it also reminds us that voters are not stupid or irrational, you know, for older voters who benefited from this system, I guess this is a rational place to be. Yeah, people vote their interests mostly. And uh, and actually, as you just said, when they've fulfilled the majority of their interests, then they can worry about high-minded ideals. Well, and let's be very, very clear, he could win because of this. And that is the craziest part. Let's put this up on the screen. Fantastic write-up here from the New York Times uh, really confirms a lot of what we've talked about here, where the headline is, if everyone voted, would Biden benefit not anymore. So if you voted in the 2022 primary election, it was a Biden plus five overall in the sample. But if you voted in the 2022 midterms, but not the primaries, it was just Biden plus one. In other words, people who are very invested, primary voters, people who come out when others don't, those people are skewing much more heavily Biden. Let's go and head to the next one because this confirms even more. If you voted in the 2020 presidential election, but you didn't vote in a primary, or in a midterm, Trump is actually winning that group by plus one. So what do we know about presidential elections? Huge portions of the public only come out to vote in presidentials if they come out to vote at all. Mostly infrequent. They might like Trump. They hadn't voted since 1984 or whatever. They're like, oh, I like what this guy has to say. Or I really hate Trump. Okay, I'm going to come out and vote. But they don't frequently vote. They don't, you know, uh, they don't register for campaigns or they don't sign petitions. They're not going to city council meetings, etc. Those people are the people that Trump is winning right now. Let's go to the next one too as well. No voting history. This is the crazy part. And this is what Biden people should really be afraid of. It's Trump plus 14. People People who have never voted before. Now, again, that's could be a good thing if they do come out to vote. It's also, uh, you know, the past is usually predictive of future behavior. As in, if you've never voted before, why should we have any confidence that you're actually going to go and vote on election day or get a mail-in ballot and send it in? It takes a little bit of effort, effort that you've never mustered previously. If we'll go to the next part as well, you can continue to see if everyone voted, again, it is not Trump, it is not Biden who would benefit. And the reason why this is such a big flip is just because in all of the past previously, it was a democratic talking point that if we just got these 100 million people who had never voted before, if they actually came out to vote, Democrats would win every single election. But Trump has completely realigned that where these frequent voters, suburban women and older voters who are voting on either abortion and or preserving democracy, they are crawling over broken glass to participate. And it used to be that many of those people were Republicans, but a lot of them are very rich and a lot of them are very old. And on aggregate, those are the people that you would always want to be coming out for you because that's how you prevail at the local and the state and the federal election. So Obama was kind of the inverse of this. He was the king of winning the infrequent voter, which is why he would win. 
Meanwhile, you know, a thousand state house seats, both chambers of Congress, midterm elections, he would always suffer. Now it seems that Biden is actually flipping that around. Then, you know, we come down to this trite, you know, observation, quote unquote, it comes down to turnout. But unironically, it really does here, Crystal, because yeah. this time, if it's a high turnout election, like in 2020, I think Trump is going to win. If it's a low turnout election, then I think Biden is going to win because he's got more uh, actual frequent voters who are coming out. And on balance, those are the people in general who you want to bet on. You never know. What if it rains on election day? What if this happens? What if that happens? Like the people who you want who are always voting, that those are the people who you want with you on election day. And the funny thing is, even the two parties don't seem to have realized the way this has flipped because so much of modern political history, I mean, think of all the battles that have been fought over like voter ID. Yeah, and right. it's always Democrats on the side of let's do mail-in voting. Let's have a longer early voting period. Let's extend the hours. Let's make it easier to vote. Let's make it so you don't have to have a driver's license in order to vote so we can get as many people as possible to the polls. And the Republicans have are always, and continue, by the way, to be on the other side of that, of let's restrict the hours, let's make it harder to vote, let's require various forms of ID in order to vote. That just political logic, you know, there's a morality question around that too, but just in terms of like the naked political calculus, it should now be Democrats who are like, let's make it harder to vote, let's make it so that it's only during like working hours and so only old retirees can easily go and cast their ballots. So I think even the parties haven't recognized the way this shift has occurred. It's hard for me to wrap my head around because this is so baked in to the Obama era, like conception of politics, that the infrequent voters, that this new rising young coalition is the core of the Democratic Party and the Republicans have the older voters who are always reliable. That's why they always crush the Democrats in special election and midterms. We have seen the way that's flipped. And so, you know, as we've been covering the special, the special elections, and um, in particular, like we just covered the one in Ohio 6, where Democrats outperformed by 20 points in a very red, red district that Trump won by 29 points, that is a story of who turned out. Um, I believe we were looking at some of the numbers in one of the key counties there, the Republican candidate, who did prevail, but it was much more narrow than it should have been, um, he was only able to draw about 12% of Trump's 2020 totals there, whereas the Democratic candidate, who spent no money, by the way, and was like, basically, no one had ever heard of this person, um, he was able to obtain about 22% of Joe Biden's vote total. So it's just purely a matter of turnout. So who's going to show up on election day? I mean, it really is very interesting. It's hard for me to imagine that people who have never voted in a presidential election before are going to find this particular election so like exciting and compelling that they're going to show up. But even when you're just looking at the universe of people who voted last presidential election, okay, well, that seems more plausible that those people show back up again in another presidential election. And guess what? Among those people, Trump does have the edge. Yeah, bingo. And uh, let's put this up there. The traditional voter demographic that... Uh, by the Biden voters and the Democratic Party could always rely on black voters. Well, uh, here you see an oversample by USA Today. Black voters are not thrilled with Biden, but they dislike Trump more. Uh, if you dig, though, into a little bit, they show, quote, how Biden has lost ground, not necessarily to Trump, but either to non-voting or to third-party candidates. And, quote, in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, where the race could be decided by the slimmest of margin, the president can hardly afford to lose any support from his most reliable base as he faces a rematch with Trump. And the support is not really as big as he previously thought. It's actually in Pennsylvania, he's getting some 56% of the vote. But RFK Jr. and Cornell West are racking up almost 15% combined. And you've still got 14% who are undecided. In Michigan, for what I have in front of me, very similar numbers. Joe Biden, 54%. Trump's got 15 But again, RFK Jr. and Cornell West are combined percentage, roughly around 14 points, and then undecided at 14 as well. So this is where the third party phenomenon could really come back to Biden because you cannot afford to lose those votes in the slimmest of margins, especially in the cities, places like Detroit and Pennsylvania, where really those cities, those margins are their lack of performance in 2016, that's what cost Hillary the election, in, both in Pennsylvania and in Michigan, uh, and Wisconsin too, actually. Milwaukee and many of the uh, urban core uh, in Wisconsin, a lot of those voters, they just didn't come out to vote when they previously had voted for Obama, and boom, Trump wins the election.
Yeah, and um, this was a demographic too where we saw a weakness for Democrats in the midterms. Yep. It was kind of cover up, covered up by the fact that uh, they had outperformance in other areas and so were able to, you know, uh, do much better than people thought they were going to do, much better than historically the party in power does during midterms. But this was a notable place of weakness. And if you dig into the numbers of, oh, okay, black voters who backed Joe Biden last time, but they're not saying they're going to back him this time, what are their reasons? And what they say is that um, more than a third say they, they just haven't been impressed with his performance in office. Okay, fair enough. So just sort of general, like, I don't feel like this is going all that well. 14% said he's too old for the job. 13% said that they are concerned about a support for Israel during the war in Gaza. That was interesting to me that that number was as high as the mm. he's too old number. And mm. another 11% said that Biden hasn't kept his promises. So, um, you know, in a lot of sense, uh, you know, Charlemagne is obviously, you know, he's he's an entertainer and a prominent figure, but I, I do feel like he's been representing a lot of these feelings in the way that he's discussed the Biden presidency and his unwillingness to come out and actively endorse him this time around. Now, he's indicated all but come out and said, okay, he's gonna vote for Joe Biden again, but he feels that promises have been broken. He feels that he was sort of, you know, led down the garden path last time around and can't put himself out in the same way. And so, you know, the question for Democrats is, number one, is RFK Jr., Cornell West, are they gonna actually be on the ballot? That's question number one. Yeah, good and point. number two, when you come down to it and people realize like, okay, but at the end of the day, it's gonna be Biden or Trump, does that bring people back around? And there's a good chance that it will, we should say, because that's typically what happens frequently with third party candidates is when things get real and, you know, people are really focused in on this come September, October, there is a kind of, you know, realization that there are only really two viable choices and support for third party candidates falls off. That's historically what's happened. Is that what happens this time around? Big question mark. Yeah, we'll, we will see, uh, as they say. But overall, interesting signs and just more so about one of the great lessons that we can all take away from this is that politics is a, is a living thing. It doesn't just stay static. Things have changed dramatically in four years. They have become unrecognizable in 16 years. And all of those people who wrote books about the laws of politics, ugh, James Carville, 40 yeah. more years, et cetera, didn't work out. And I think that's yeah. a great thing because it shows that people are not static, that they do pay attention, they change their mind, and just because what they, what they change their main mind on may not be what the pundit class wants them to, they certainly do pay attention in their own way. So I have more faith actually in the American people because they're always actually changing their mind and looking at things and deciding things on the fly. And I think that's good. Hey, if you like that video, hit the like button or leave a comment below. It really helps get the show to more people. And if you'd like to get the full show, ad-free, and in your inbox every morning, you can sign up at breakingpoints.com. That's right. Get the full show. Help support the future of independent media at breakingpoints.com.